Hello, I'm Peter Bogdanovich. From 1949 into 1952, Orson Welles was directing and starring in his own production of Shakespeare's Othello, shot on location around Europe and North Africa. For various reasons, financial at first and then actor scheduling, he had to suspend shooting for periods of time during which he would then act in other people's movies like Black Magic or Prince of Foxes, using his salary from these to finance Othello. But there was also, as I said, actors' availabilities to consider, and two of his actors were very old friends of Orson's, Hilton Edwards, playing Desdemona's father, Brabantio, and Michael McLeamore, who co-starred with Wells as the infamous Siago. These two were the founders and directors of Dublin's highly respected Gate Theatre, and one of the long breaks from shooting Othello came about because Edwards and McLeamore had to do their repertory season in Dublin. These two men and the Gate Theatre were especially important to Orson Welles because it was there that he'd acted for the first time professionally back in the early 30s when he was just 16. Looking and sounding far beyond his years, he had convinced Edwards and McLeamore that he was a well-known actor in the States, though they later claimed not to have been fooled, but only charmed. Anyway, the three became fast friends, and so, directing his first movie in Europe, he wanted them to be a part of it. During one of Orson's breaks from Othello, late in 1951, Edwards and McLeamore asked him to become involved in a little film project of their own, one that Edwards had scripted and planned to direct. It was called Return to Glenys Call, and as the film's subtitle would explain, it was a story that is told in Dublin, a kind of ghost legend about a man who encounters a couple of women on a lonely road at night, and what happens when they take him back to their home, back to Glenys Call for an evening's drink. Orson would play himself, also driving on a lonely road when he encounters this man who then tells Orson the strange story. The entire two-reel short would then be framed by Wells's experience, and he would narrate as your obedient servant, a phrase familiar to radio listeners from Orson's many years with his own famous dramatic shows on that long-lost medium, just beginning to fade at the time this little film was made. Glenys Call, as we find, means Glen of the Shadows, shadows being another word for ghosts. An evocative and virtually unknown little curiosity, the picture received an Academy Award nomination in 1953 for Best Two-Reel Short Subject, got fairly limited distribution in Ireland that year and in the UK and the United States, and then disappeared. It's a likable and unpretentious effort, awkward in certain ways, but strangely haunting nonetheless, of course, its greatest interest today is because of Orson Welles' brief appearances in it and his typically expressive narration. Untypical, though, is Orson agreeing to be seen without makeup of any kind. He's about 36 here. The only other example being as the notorious Harry Lyme in The Third Man, also made during this period. In fact, the effective solo harp from Glenys Call somewhat recalls to us that famous zither music from that film. For film buffs, there's also a little inside joke early in the picture when the traveler Orson picks up explains his car's breakdown, saying he's had trouble with his distributor. Turning the word to a different use, Orson says, yes, he's had trouble with his distributor too, a veiled comic allusion to Wells' difficulties with Hollywood studios. So here's a return to return to Glenys Call with its touchingly appropriate quote from the Song of Solomon, which Orson recorded a couple of times in his career, a quote applicable to the shadows of the silver screen as well, those ghosts from the pictures of the past, until the day break and the shadows flee away. Take them back. 
by the insolent foe and sold to slavery of my redemption fence. And portents in my travels history, wherein of antries vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills, whose heads touch heaven, it was my interest. I'm sorry, I can't get the thing at all. Let's break for lunch. Michael, Michael, Michael. Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come Ladies and gentlemen, this is your obedient servant, Orson Welles speaking. I'm interrupting here the making of one movie to speak these few words at the beginning of well, what shall we call this? A short story. A short story straight from the haunted land of Ireland. Haunted, I say, because there's no place in the world so crowded with the raw material of tall tales. That's what this is, then, a tall tale. Purportedly, it happened to me. But I promise shortly to withdraw from the proceedings and to return to my own movie studio and my own movie, but not before taking this opportunity to apologize to the two ladies I passed so very abruptly. Irish midnight not so long ago. I have to be in Ireland. Still, I'm afraid wearing a beard for Othello. To talk Othello business with Hilton. That's Mr. Hilton Edwards, who produced and directed the story that now follows. That night, I'd been visiting the country, and I was driving back. And I saw, when I drove to Dublin, a man tinkering with the motor of his car. I slowed up and asked if I could give him a lift. All right. Hey, need any help? Thanks very much, but it's no use, I'm afraid. I'll have to leave her here and send for her in the morning. Where are we exactly? I'm a stranger here myself. You're no better than I do. I'm pretty close to Dublin. You live there? Hey? Yes, 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 I do. You want a lift? No, no thanks. Pretty cold here, huh, in the middle of the country, you sure? I know, but thanks very much. I'd rather not. Okay. Are you sure? Well, I I would be obliged if it's all the same to you. Well, I'd better come around this side. Sorry. Just a moment. What happened to your car? I had trouble with the distributor. Uh, but I say, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. I've had trouble with my distributor, too. I haven't been in Dublin much in the last few years. You're going to have to direct me. Where do you live? I live in Bankett Street. Not far from the bridge. I'll show you when we get there. Here's a cigarette. Thanks. Do me a favor, will you please, and put it in my mouth. I've got these gloves on. There you are. Thanks. It's a nice case. Yes, isn't it? As a matter of fact, I had rather a strange experience. At that exact part of the road where you picked me up tonight. Hold up? Yes. Well, not exactly. Tell me about it. Well, I don't even think you believe me. Sometimes I hardly even believe it myself. I was against a doubted experience. It must have been a good one. I'm not the sort of person who imagines things. Tell me what happened. Well, it was about a year ago. I was driving back from the south. Well, here's the story he told me. I don't ask you to believe it. I'll just tell it where I didn't let you judge me. So it seems he'd been driving along this same road. It was a nasty night, and the rain made it very difficult to see ahead. Just as he got near the crossroads, the same crossroads where I picked him up, he saw two women signaling him to stop. Please forgive us stopping you. Do you want a lift? If it isn't taking you out of your way. I'd be delighted. 
Where do you want me to drive you? We live in Hill Park Avenue. The house is Glenis Call. Is that very inconvenient? Not at all. Practically on my way. So good of you. So he drove them home. This is the house. I think the gate's open. The house stood well back from the road. or perhaps something stronger. It's a cold night. Well, it's very nice of you, but I think I'd better be getting along home. Are you sure? Yeah, quite sure, thank you. Just for a moment. All right, then. Just for a moment. The house was called Glenys Call. <laughs> for Glen of the Shadows. Would you care to leave your coat down here? Yes, I will, thank you. I built up the fire before we went out. We shall have the kettle boiling in no time. We always have a cup of tea before we go to bed. People say that it keeps you awake, but nothing keeps us awake, does it, dear? Now that the rain's over, it's going to be a lovely night. I do hope the fire's kept in. This is such a drafty house. Chinese. Oh, yes. It was a present. An old friend. He lived in the East for many years. He gave my daughter a lot of beautiful things. We haven't seen him for a long time now. Ah, oh, here we are. That's good. The fire's kept in nicely. Lamplight, how nice. Oh, yes. Put the kettle on, dear. Sit by the fire. You must be cold. Thank you, I will. Would you prefer whiskey? Yes, I would, if I may. You smoke? We don't smoke, thank you. May I? Please do. Tea in a suburban home. Uh, Nothing out of the way about that. Yeah, would you help yeah, as he sat there, there Thanks. chatting yes, with yes, the two yes. ladies, he felt that something, Water. he couldn't tell what, but something Water. was definitely Water. out of the way. May I look? Yes, yes, of course. Wonderful. Pre-war, isn't it? Pre-war? I don't really know. It's beautiful, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, that, yes. It was left me by an uncle, my father's brother. I've always liked to keep it. As a matter of fact, that's why I was interested in that tapestry on the stairs. My uncle went to China. In fact, he died there. That is a memento from the days that he lived in Dublin. 
you see there's an inscription inside. For P. J. M. From Lucy, Dublin, 1895. Probably a present from an old flame. I think it was one of those love affairs that went wrong. Anyhow, he never married. And there's a quotation. I think it's from the Song of Solomon. Until the daybreak and shadows flee away. One o'clock. Don't go. I'm afraid I must. Wouldn't you like another drink? Thank you. Another time I'd be delighted. Come and see us again when you're passing. The name is Campbell. And mine's Merriman. Sean Merriman. See Mr. Merriman to the door, dear. Glenis Call House. I'll not forget. Goodbye now, and many thanks. Thank you. I'd like to, if I may. Goodbye. said he'd driven not more than a hundred yards from the gate he realized he'd left his cigarette case behind on the mantel of the sitting room upstairs first he thought he'd call for it in the morning but they couldn't be in bed already they must still be up there drinking their tea so he decided to go back right away got to the gate, he found them closed. He figured he must have been mistaken. And they were closed, and they were so stiff he could hardly open. The drive was choked with brushwood and fallen branches. No car could have driven down that road in months. the other house it looked. A few minutes ago he'd been inside a place almost exactly like this one, sitting by the fire, drinking and smoking, talking. It was alive and warm. And this place was cold and dead. for it to go away. No good. 
but standing all night alone in that weed-choked garden, staring at the dead windows of that empty house. There was a real estate agent sign, apply daily and come for that's what we do tomorrow. Dennis Cold House. Here we are. Thank you. How long has this house been vacant? Oh, it's been unoccupied for years. No, no, thank you. What I really want to know is, who lived there? Let me see. Belonged to some ladies, mother and daughter. Just can't recollect the name at the moment. What it was? Wouldn't be Campbell, would it? Yes, that's right. Were they... Was she, the daughter, I mean, was she a delicate-looking girl with red hair? <laughs> I shouldn't exactly describe her as a girl. She was well over 60. Her mother was 80 if she was a day. She's been dead a long time now. Oh, I see. I don't know what happened to Miss Campbell. If you're interested, I can give you the name of the solicitors for whom we handle the property. Thank you. I'll leave these back with you in the morning. Oh, that's all right. Hope the place suits you. Hello. It was the same place, no doubt of that. And by daylight, it looked more desolate than ever. He tried to tell himself again that he'd come back to the wrong address. But all the same. to the floor where he was standing. They were the same.
Well, that's the story. And here, if it interests you at all, is the cigarette case. I just hear second lamppost on the right. I wrote to the solicitors that the agents told me about, and I learned that Mrs. Campbell died ten years before. Her daughter lived only two years after. This is the point. The daughter's name was Lucy. Well, then, well, who's this PM? Patrick Joseph Merriman, my father's brother. Thanks for the lift. Would you like to come in and have a cup of tea or maybe something stronger? It's a cold night. Oh, no, no, sir. Thank you very much. No, I'd uh, just be getting along. Thank you. Leave it. 